As we think about normal swallowing function, it's important that we don't think of swallowing as occurring uh, according to this rather arbitrary model. Even though we've all learned, you know, there's an oral phase, a pharyngeal phase, and an esophageal phase, which, which is a nice explanation, really, of where the bolus is flowing. It doesn't really capture the synergistic properties of the complex swallowing mechanism. In fact, there's a great deal of overlap in structural movement, interdependence of structural movement and bolus flow that's not truly appreciated if we keep our understanding of swallowing to this limited simplistic model. Uh, we actually challenged this model in 2005 by looking at the onset and offset of, offset of all of the relevant events of swallowing movement and bolus flow and found that rather than swallowing uh, these events segmenting into an oral, a pharyngeal, and esophageal, for example, there really was this synergy. There's this one-factor solution in a statistical model that's oral pharyngeal because of the rapid way that these events um, occur and overlap with one another. I want you to watch this uh, really wonderful patient who really puts it all together for you that you can't assume anything. Uh, she has a pulmonary um, condition, uh, severe COPD, and she'll talk about how it influences her eating, her voice, her swallowing, uh, so not just her breathing, and her uh, uh, daily living activities, uh, the ability to get dressed, to reach up to do your hair, to do your makeup, etc. I can breathe. Can walk up the stairs at my house. Can go out to feed the dog. I mean, I couldn't do anything. Had to start wearing oxygen, which you get ready to go somewhere and you have to go load tanks and you have to be in a hurry to get home because your tanks are almost empty. And I have gotten up before and nearly pulled my nose off because I forget I had the tank. And it's been two years now. My voice is squeaky. It affected my voice, too. If I talk a lot, I give out of breath. But if I eat fast, so I try to eat slow. Sometimes if you drink, it feels like you're drowning. So clearly, she's an excellent example of cross-system interactions between respiration, swallowing, and voice. And you have to consider all systems simultaneously and not look at one in a vacuum. Because clearly, you wouldn't want to recommend to this type of patient to do some complex maneuver like, you know, a breath hold, throat clear, double swallow. They're going to be difficult for her. And then the, there's the Toronto Bedside Swallow Screening uh, Test by Rosemary Martino et al. She's done a tremendous amount of work in validating this method. This is um, an approach where speech-language pathology trains nursing staff in a very standardized manner, and there are several publications uh, about Torbest. So um, some strong evidence. This one is the only one that I could find that actually requires training for implementation or um, to train the nursing staff. A video fluoroscopic study. If you're going to be able to report your findings and interpret your findings across a continuum of care, you have to have some standardized protocol of materials that you're giving a patient with regard to viscosity, volume, and type. Okay, but there's some flexibility involved. You're not gonna give all the protocol to all patients. It depends on severity of the patient and other factors as well. Um, you may introduce some bolus materials that you just absolutely feel that you need to give the patient. But when you use a standardized set to assess physiology, and response to treatment, you will find that you don't need to give multiple different types of consistencies during a modified barium swallow study. There are all re kinds of reasons not to do that. Um, there are infection control reasons. There are patient risk reasons. And if you understand things like 
the ability to contain a bolus in the oral cavity with tongue control, and you understand what their initiation, their pharyngeal swallow is like, you'll know how they're going to do with mixed consistencies, for example, without having to give chicken soup or things like fruit cocktail during, exa during an exam. Um, if we don't standardize what we're doing in any of our assessments, video fluoroscopy or otherwise, it very much impedes our understanding of true functional results. Uh, it, it, it produces ambiguous reporting of outcomes. You're comparing apples to oranges. And it hinders our understanding of restorative surgical and rehab targets. People will say, yes, but we need to individualize our assessments. We do need to individualize our assessments within reason. But, you know, their art and science are mixed, uh, but this isn't isn't a, um, an exercise in creativity. This is an exercise in using protocols that have been well uh, validated uh, that yield clinical information.